Hello everyone, welcome to another recommends video. This time we're going to be doing a novel called The Forge of God, written by Greg Bear and published in 1987. It was nominated for the Nebula Award for Best Novel in 1987 and also for the Hugo and Locus Awards in 1988. Before we continue, if you haven't subscribed, please consider doing so. Drop us a comment and leave us a thumbs up and let's get into it. Our story begins on June 26, 1996. Arthur Gordon, an astronomer and former advisor to the president, his wife Francine and their son Marty are at their cabin on the Rogue River entertaining guests. And they are his wife's sister Danielle and brother-in-law Grant and their daughter Becky. He gets a call from Chris Riley, a colleague from Caltech, who informs him that Europa Jupiter's sixth moon has disappeared. He immediately gets his telescope and goes and verifies the information for himself. Newspaper reports say that it doesn't seem to be a collision because if it was a collision, we would at least have seen the pieces. September 28th and 29th. Edward Shaw, Brad Manelli, and Victor Reschler are camping in the hills just outside Death Valley when they come across a strange mound that wasn't there before. Lying just to the outside of this mound, they find an alien. At first they thought it was dead until it lifted its head and said, I am sorry, but there is bad news. They took it down to a service station where they showed it to the proprietor who allowed them to make a call. Edward then called the Air Force and lied to them because he didn't think that they would come if he told them the truth. October 3rd and 4th, Harry Feynman has been invited to join Arthur at Rogue River. Arthur is now in charge of a special presidential task force and he asks Harry to join the team. He is unable to tell Harry the true nature of the job until Harry joins. Harry thinks it has something to do about a hill in Australia in the Great Victoria Desert that shouldn't be there. Before he accepts the job, he tells Arthur that he has chronic leukemia, but when Arthur insists, he accepts. That's when Arthur tells him about the hill in the Mojave Desert that shouldn't be there, and the alien that is right now being held at Vandenberg Air Force Base. October 5th, 1996, Trevor Hicks is in San Diego. He had just finished giving an interview to a radio station when he finds out about the thing in Australia. Excitedly, he quickly dropped all his plans and hopped on the internet to try and find out more. Meanwhile, at Vandenberg Air Force Base, Edward Shaw, Isla, Manelli, and Stella Morgan, the woman that gave them permission to make the phone call, are being held for observations since they came in contact with the alien. October 6th, 1996, the Prime Minister of Australia, Stanley Miller, decided to go public with what they found. Meanwhile, Arthur Gordon and Harry Feynman have been taken to Vandenberg Air Force Base to see the alien. Lieutenant Sanborn took them to see the alien who they are calling the guest. They have found that it is most comfortable in conditions of semi-darkness and a temperature of about 15 degrees Celsius, that it almost succumbed to the heat when it left its ship, and it speaks quite passable English. At this point, Harry and Arthur began questioning the guest. It told them that a disease had entered their system of planets and that there's little time left for their world. It said that it was a flea, a parasite, that its world was dead and eaten and it traveled here within the child of a machine that eats worlds. It told them that the machine was built by a distant people, that it controlled itself, it eats and reproduces. The machine tolerates their presence because they can't hurt it, so they ride with the machine and try to warn others of their fate. It didn't know how much time Earth had left because it wasn't aware of when it landed. That's when they got news that there were other aliens in Australia that didn't look like this one. Meanwhile, Trevor Hicks watched on TV as three alien robots exited the ship in Australia and made contact. 
and he did a little bit of digging and found out that there may be another one near Dead Valley. So he traveled to Las Vegas, which is as close to Dead Valley as he could get with the plan to drive out there the next morning. When the president arrived, the guest told his story to the president. On its world, the first ships arrived and hid themselves in the ice. Some took what they needed from the ice to build more ships. Others dug deep into the planet. One newly made ship landed in the middle of one of their cities and didn't move. Some of their people boarded the ship and built a home in the ship. The ship did not stop them. The ship took off just before their world was destroyed. It told the president it brought this message because on some worlds, they may be able to fight back. They asked the guest if it believed in God. It said it believed in punishment. It said the death of a world is a judgment on its inadequacy. Death removes the unnecessary and the false. Before he left, the president stopped in to see the four civilians that were being held. The president then visited the area of Dead Valley where the alien ship was. After he left, Trevor Hicks showed up in the area where he met Bernice Morgan, who is Stella Morgan's mother, who was doing everything she can to find out what the Air Force did with her daughter. She told him that the area around Furnace Creek where he wanted to go was blocked off. A couple of her friends, Mitch Morris, Ron Flagg, and Frank Forrest came in with a plan to fly a small plane over the area to see if they could see what's going on. They invited Hicks to come along, which he did, and as they got into the area, two military helicopters intercepted them and forced them to land. The plane was forced to land, the pilot lost his license, and the plane was confiscated. Three of the men were reprimanded while Hicks was invited to see the president because the president had read one of his books. At dinner later that evening, the president informed Hicks about what was going on and he made the decision to share information with the Australians. And just as he did so, he got a message that the guest had died. Later, the president met privately with Hicks where he expressed the belief that this may be God punishing us for our transgressions. Now that the guest was dead, Arthur Gordon had ordered his team to investigate the interior of the furnace. That's what they were calling the ship in Dead Valley. On October 8, it made the papers that the president had visited Dead Valley and that it may be related to the Australian aliens. Lieutenant Colonel Albert Rogers entered the furnace with some cameras. After he had traveled about 80 feet in, he came to a cylindrical chamber that was about 30 feet long and 20 feet across. When he walked to the edge, he was looking into a cavern that was 100 feet long by 80 feet high. He was about 20 feet from the bottom. It was filled with shiny facets that looked like it was made of blue-gray glass. He turned off all the lights and noticed that there was a tiny red light in the darkness. He didn't think that the ship was dead, that it was just waiting. October 10th. The stress of being held was beginning to tell on the four civilians at Vandenberg. Meanwhile, in Washington, D.C., Hicks was a guest of the president and was able to read the autopsy of the guest. The conclusion that the autopsy came to was that the guest was an artificial being that was probably the product of centuries of genetic manipulation combined with complex bioelectronics. He also read the report from Australia, which said that the robots conveyed a sense of goodwill and benevolent concern. They wished to help the inhabitants of Earth fulfill their potential, come together in harmony and exercise their rights as potential citizens in a galaxy-wide exchange. The president and his team met with the Australians in the Oval Office. They came to a decision. They were going to confront the robots in Australia with the information they have gathered and were given to them by the guest and see what they say. On his way to Australia, Arthur stopped in California to visit Harry, who had just had some treatments for his cancer. Harry is beginning to 
believed that they were being played with. For what reason, he didn't know. When they got to Australia, Arthur was allowed to question the robots. He told them everything they had learned uh, from the guest and he asked them to explain the differences between them and the guest. He also asked them to explain the disappearance of Europa, the moon of Jupiter. The robots claimed to know nothing about it and retreated back into their ship which promptly disappeared. Later, while he was talking to his wife, Arthur found out that there was two comet-like asteroids on collision course with Venus and Mars. November 2nd, on his ship, the Gloma Discoverer, Walt Samsho witnessed what he thought was a meteor hitting the ocean somewhere in the East Pacific. All three ships in the area registered it on their gravimeters. Meanwhile, it's election time in the U.S. and President Crockerman is running for office in his own right, having taken over when the last president died. But he's beginning to push aside his scientific advisors and reading revelations and listening to a religious fundamentalist named Ormandy. His advisors are at wit's end and are now trying to get Arthur and Harry to talk to the president, hoping he will listen to them. So Hicks, Arthur, Harry, Schwartz all met with the president and tried to convince him to not go public after the election, to try to convince him that we are not facing God's wrath. But the president believes that something so catastrophic wouldn't happen to earth without God's approval. The president believes that it is his job to help the country face the end bravely. He believes that nothing can be done to stop what's going to happen and so we shouldn't even try. The president also revealed to them that the NSC found what seems to be another hidden spacecraft in Mongolia. But in the end, they were unable to convince him. They decided after the meeting that after the election, they were going to try and force the president to prepare and fight back instead of just accepting defeat. Mr. Ormandy called Hicks and met with him. And it seems that he is not at all convinced that the president is on the right track. When Hicks asked him to try and change the president's mind, Ormandy said he would try. November 5th. Arthur met with some astronomers and they determined that the two ice asteroids had come from Europa and that they were going to hit both Venus and Mars. The smaller one, which was 180 kilometers in diameter, would hit Mars on December 21st, 1996. And the larger one, which was 250 kilometers in diameter, would hit Venus on February 4th, 1997. They were now convinced that all these events were linked. And Arthur was going to try and talk to the president and convince him. But before he could, on November 10th, the president began his speech before the both houses of Congress, where he told the entire story and then ended with the fact that he believed that this was an act of God punishing us on earth for our wickedness and that we should accept our faith and make our peace with God. Arthur visited Harry, who was now too sick to travel. Harry believed he was not going to make it. November 15th, Honolulu. Walt Sancho goes to a party where he meets Jeremy Kemp, who tells him that their listening post and seismograph equipment registered an anomaly, which turns out to be the same one that Sancho saw that night from his boat. The readings say that it is a plug of super dense matter, probably a black hole that is burrowing deep into the earth. With the president's announcement, it doesn't seem to be a coincidence, but they are going to get some experts to take a look. When Arthur visited the furnace again, it was surrounded by three layers of fences. The inner one was electrified, and around those fences were sightseers and news people. Arthur handed Colonel Rogers a set of orders telling him that all soldiers had to stay out of the ship, but since the orders did not pertain to Arthur, Arthur was going to go in and take a look for himself and Colonel Rogers was going to lead him in. November 17th, the four civilians were finally freed and allowed to have a press conference. Arthur entered the furnace and realized that the only change was that the red light had gone out. November 20th, 
the New York Times editorial called the election of President William Quackerman a colossal blunder and that for any president of the United States to admit defeat and urge us all to say our prayers is, in a word, treasonous. Ruben Hordes of Warren, Ohio, met some small robotic spiders that climbed on him and took control of his mind. Meanwhile, Arthur, who is now at home with his wife and son, gets a call from Chris Riley, who tells him that three men, Samsho, Kemp, and Sand, think they've found the weapon that will be used against Earth. He gave Arthur their number. Arthur called them and then announced to his wife and son that he'll be going to San Francisco in a few days. November 22nd, while Marty was looking through the telescope, he noticed something flashing up in the sky that he had Arthur take a look at. Arthur sees it and then calls Chris Riley, who tells him that it looks as if there were asteroids blowing up up in the asteroid belt and Riley thinks it's all connected. Meanwhile, Edward, Minnelli, and Risha are all staying with Stella and her mother to avoid the press. Meanwhile, in San Francisco, Samsho, Sand, and Kemp find out that another highly dense object fell to Earth, this time in the Atlantic, and it is burrowing its way into the Earth. They tried to get a hold of the White House to tell this to them, but they are being ignored by them. So they got a hold of Arthur Gordon, who is on his way to see them. Meanwhile in Ohio, Reuben was having a voice in his head that the spiders put there, an English voice, and he finally figured out who it belongs to. The voice belonged to Trevor Hicks, and he had to carry one of the spiders to Trevor Hicks. So he gathered what little money he had and headed for Washington, D.C. Arthur finally got to San Francisco and met with Sam Sho and Kemp and sand and the information they relayed to him indicated that there were two highly dense objects that are falling into the center of the earth very slowly which reminded them of a fuse and what happens when they meet at the center no one really knows back near dead valley edward and stella are making plans to meet next year even though they both don't believe that the earth will be there next year december 1st lieutenant colonel rogers meets with two people, a man and a woman, and they are conspiring to do something to stop what's going to happen, even if it means using nuke to blow up the ship. They know the president may get impeached, but that may take a while and they feel that they're running out of time. December 15th, Arthur is in his house when he gets a call. It's from Harry's wife, Ithaca, who tells him Harry is dying and wants to see him. He heads for the airport and when he gets there, he's intercepted by a young woman who tells she has something for him. She hands him a little box. When it's opened, it's a metallic spider that nips him on the thumb and then crawls into his shirt and nips him on the abdomen. By the time he was on the plane, the spider was feeding him information. Meanwhile, in Washington, Ruben manages to get a hold of Hicks and gives Hicks just enough information for Hicks to agree to meet with him. Arthur, meanwhile, visited Harry and told Harry about the mechanical spider and told Harry that there was some hope and he told Harry this so that Harry could die in peace. Arthur kissed Harry on the forehead and left and then thanked the spider for allowing him to do that. Back in Washington, Ruben and Hicks met in the hotel cafe and Ruben told him everything he knew. But Hicks was afraid to let the spider bit him because he was afraid that it will take control of him and he will no longer be himself. So when Hicks got up and went to the bar, Ruben put the spider on the chair. When Hicks returned and sat down, the spider bit him. Ruben left and Hicks went up to his room. Once there, the spider fed him information. And finally, at some point in time, it dropped to the floor, went over to the TV, drilled a hole inside, and created a copy of itself. And both spiders came out and went into Hicks's pocket. Apparently, there are two groups of Von Neumann machines. One group has come to destroy Earth and all the humans on Earth, and the other group is come to try and stop them. The second group, when it got into the solar system, needed to create more copies of itself and to get more power. So to do that, it needed water. So it went to Europa and 
took Europa and turned that into more copies of itself. Then it came to Earth, but by the time it came to Earth, it was too late. The first group had already set things in motion to destroy Earth. All that the second group could do now is to save as much of Earth's culture as it can and maybe save about two to three thousand humans. But it didn't have much time to accomplish all that they needed to. Meanwhile, both groups were fighting each other out in the asteroid belt. Meanwhile, it's speculated on the news that what is going down into Earth's core is a neutrinium and an anti-neutrinium. Uh, when they meet in the center, they will destroy Earth. December 23rd, Walt Samsho and David Sand received pictures that were released to the public by the Secretary of Defense. There seems to be some kind of power struggle going on between the president and the military. All the pictures were of deep ocean regions taken from low earth orbit submarine tracking satellites. They showed that the ocean surfaces above all of the world's deep trenches had high oxygen concentrations. The oxygen concentrations were getting so high that pretty soon forests and cities were going to begin catching on fire. December 24th, the news hit that Reverend Ormandy was killed by a lone gunman in New Orleans. President Crockerman vetoed the Alien Defense Act and the Forge of Goddess gathered to protect the alien craft. The Forge of Goddess are a new religious cult that believe that the earth should be destroyed because of humans' wickedness. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Colonel Rogers, members of the NSA, and an admiral and a senator have gotten together to get a nuclear weapon to sneak it into the alien craft and blow it up in an attempt to try and save Earth. January 3rd, 1997, Arthur is at home with his wife after taking his son to school. He told her about the spiders and showed them to her. He gets a call from the president who feels he's under siege and he asks Arthur if there's a conspiracy against him and who is part of it. Arthur doesn't know and when he says that, the president hangs up. January 4th, Ruben met with a money man in Washington DC who handed him a bag full of money. Ruben had a shopping list of items in his head that he had to get a hold of. The first thing he had to do was to buy four sets of data discs containing the entire public domain non-fiction records of the Library of Congress. January 5th, Lieutenant Colonel Rogers met with Senator Gilman and a lieutenant from the Air Force who brought a nuclear bomb for him. He then took the bomb up into the ship and armed it. When he tried to leave, he realized that the tunnel that he entered through was now sealed. He was now sealed inside with the bomb and he refused to disarm it, so it detonated, killing him and destroying the ship. January 6th, Arthur was now linked with the other possessed and through them he could see in his mind what was happening around the world. There were fires burning around the world. Parts of New York, Chicago and New Orleans were all on fire. Tokyo and Beijing also on fire. Forests in different parts of the world were also on fire. January 15th, Walt Samsho and David Sand are on their ship and they're out there searching for more concentrations of oxygen. Feeling depressed that all they can do is go and look and verify, but that there's nothing they can do to stop what's happening. January 30th, Edward is headed to Yosemite, but his path is blocked by a major fire in Montana that he has to find a way around. February 4th, 1997. Today is the day that the chunk of ice is supposed to hit Venus. Scientists believe that in a couple thousands of years, Venus will become a Garden of Eden because of this collision that's happening today. February 19th, Arthur took his family and they headed out. He has work to do for the little spiders and he's taking his family with him. February 24th, Trevor Hicks finishes his work in Washington DC and heads to Boston where he is met by a woman who is another of the possessed. He's in contact mentally with all of the other possessed, who, all of whom are high-powered personalities. They were trying to decide who was going to go and to collect all of the different 
works that humans have created over the centuries. The goal being to save as much of it as they can. After he left Boston and was headed for his next site, he wondered why were they trying to save humans. That didn't make any sense and he was trying to figure that out. What was in it for them? That was also the day Harry died. March 10th. Walt Samsho and David Sand were out on the Pacific where they could barely breathe. The accident was too rich and damaging to them. They heard the news that the ship in Mongolia seems to have been destroyed by the Russians. But as long as what was happening under the ocean and deep in Earth was continuing, there was nothing they can do to stop the destruction of Earth. Meanwhile in California, Edward finally reached Yosemite where he plans to stay until the end, since that was where his happiest memories lay. Meanwhile, Ruben left Alexandria and headed for Cleveland, still doing the work that they wanted him to do. He had just turned 19 on March 15th. Arthur and Hicks met in Seattle, and each one wondering if the other will be chosen. Hicks was the one that informed Arthur that Harry had died. March 20th, Manelli drives up to see Edward. He brought him up to date on what he's been doing. They both decided that Yoshimite was a good place in which to end. Edward was still a bit angry that he didn't know why this was happening and he wished someone could tell him why this had to happen. Ruben arrived at his destination and was taken out into the middle of a lake where he met two others, a boy about 16 and a woman about 30. When they got to the middle of the lake, a gray black came up out of the water, a door opened up, it was an elevator. The three of them got in and the door closed behind them. March 25th, 1997. Scientists have finally gotten a look at Venus after the ice slammed into it and they believe that in a few centuries it will become more and more Earth-like. Edward and Manelli are settling in at Yoshimite with about 200 other people. The FBI and the NSA investigated and questioned Senator Gilman but couldn't prove anything. And what they did did not seem to have slowed down Earth's coming death. The two neutrino bullets that was in Earth's core was too far down to be traced anymore. And it seemed that in the deep ocean trenches, something was building and placing thousands of nuclear bombs. Trevor Hicks was in Seattle examining the genetic records that were sent to them by the Mormons. When he felt an alarm in his brain, Shanghai was destroyed. Then Hicks and the man he was with, Jenkins, got a message simultaneously, telepathically. Their sight and vessel in the sound are under attack. Then there was a flash of red and white, the window exploded, and that was the last thing he saw. Arthur, who was on his way to San Francisco with his family, also felt it when it happened. He told his wife that the Planet Eaters had destroyed Shanghai and Seattle in an attempt to destroy the arcs that was being built under the water. They tried to bomb San Francisco and Cleveland but were stopped. Arthur told his young son to remember what's happening here, to never forget what's happening here. At the same time, in Washington DC, the president and his cabinet was being evacuated. The president was stressed because the House had voted to impeach him. They learned that Seattle was gone and Charleston was in ruins. It wasn't the Russians or the Chinese or anything from Earth that did it. They were also told that something defended San Francisco and Cleveland and they have no idea what. Meanwhile, Arthur and his family got to the house of Grant and Danielle who are the family of Francine, his wife. Up in Yushamite, Edward called Stella and agreed that they would get together if everything worked out. The next morning, the network in Arthur's head contacted him, telling him he had to get to San Francisco right away. They got to the raft where they boarded a boat with about 20 other people and headed out into the ocean. Just past Alcatraz, the boat came to a stop and a gray black came up out of the water. A door opened up in the middle of it. They climbed down 30 feet of stairs into a spaceship that was hidden beneath the waves. They were told that in a little while they'd be leaving Earth. 
Walter Samsho was under Gloma Discover when it began. The ocean all around the ship suddenly glowed a brilliant blue-green. Then the entire sea and sky began to roar. It was the bombs going off all along the deep sea fractures. The sea all around them turned to steam and Sam and his ship was destroyed. Back in the submerged spaceship, Arthur and Clara, the woman who helped him get onto the ship, met with a machine that told them that it was a symbol designed to be acceptable without conveying wrong impressions. It was to be their guide. It was part of the vessel and that vessel would soon join other vessels to become a much larger vessel. It wanted Arthur and Clara to prepare the others because it had much to teach them. It told them that there were 31 vessels in all and on 21 of them there were humans. 500 humans apiece. The vessels also contained large numbers of botanical and zoological specimens. Most of those specimens were in pieces but would be recoverable. It told them that for the time being it will speak to them and their first task is to get at least four volunteers to witness the crime that was being committed. The president, the first lady and members of his cabinet were all in the White House when it was destroyed. On the spaceship, Edward and his family were shown to their quarters. Then he and Clara were told that they had to pick four witnesses because it was the law. It was decided that Arthur and his entire family would be witnesses. Meanwhile, Grant, Francine's brother-in-law, had followed them to see where they were going, and he stood and witnessed the spaceship take off. He felt relief that at least someone would survive. Arthur was told that the ship he was in held 412 passengers. In the end, about 80 people, including kids, were witnesses. One of the witnesses that Arthur met was Ruben. Other ships began joining with their own, Singapore, Istanbul, Cleveland. The end finally came for Edward and Manelli and the others that were up on Glacier Point in Yosemite as the park ripped itself apart. From over 10,000 miles away, Arthur and the other witnesses watched as the earth was destroyed while the arcs were running away from its vicinity. After two hours, the earth was gone and in its place was a spreading new belt of asteroids. It is December 21st, 2397 on New Mars and Francine Gordon is the editor of the New Mars Gazette. The machines that saved them have put them in hibernation for 400 years while Mars was terraformed. They have been reviving people on a staggered schedule. 400 more people have just been revived from the Eurasian arcs. The moms are preparing them for their arrival on New Mars. The name Mars was given to the robots, the machines, by Ruben Hordes, who was revived eight years ago, and he's now on the New Venus Reconnaissance Mission. The human population stands at 12,250. There was a high suicide rate on New Mars, but it has started to drop in the last three years. New Mars no longer had moons as they used Phobos and Deimos to slam into Mars to create organic material for their farmlands. Down in the Rift Valley, their breeders were tending the first animals born out of genetic storage. It's been about a year since the moms have given them back autonomy and Arthur was hoping that they didn't screw it up to have it taken away from them. It had happened before while they were on the main arc, when human authority had broken down into anarchy. Ruben was in charge of a mission headed to Mars to find out when Mars would be habitable. It'll probably be a few more centuries before that happens. Arthur missed his son Martin, who was on the seventh ship of law with 50 other human crewmates seeking the home system of Earth's killers. They had left just eight years after Earth's destruction. Arthur remembers what the moms told him, that the galaxy was a vaguely explored frontier at best and a vicious jungle at worst. Meanwhile, on the ship of law that Martin was on, they found that the planet eaters had not come a great distance to Earth. Evidence of them 
was apparent less than a hundred light years from the sun. All of the ship of Lost was made from the material of a dead earth. He had asked the moms if they found the civilization of the planet eaters and it has matured. What if it is beautiful, noble and rich with culture and it regrets its past mistakes? Do we still destroy it? The mom said yes. When asked why, the mom said because it's the law. The builders of the planet eaters had realized that they may be able to be traced. So they laced the planetary systems around their parent star with dozens of false civilizations, misleading beacons, and even genetically engineered biological decoys, completing every detail but one, the ability to mislead a ship of law. Three ship years ago, Martin had walked on the surface of one such decoy planet. The planet had sophisticated defenses and barely escaped the trap. Although he had intellectual misgivings, Martin was committed, and every day before he went to sleep, he swore an oath that he made up himself. To those who killed Earth, beware her children. And that is how the book ends. I want to thank you for watching and listening. I would like you to subscribe if you haven't. Give us a thumbs up, leave us a comment, and I will see you in the next video.